how long from I'm going to start doing networking like Netacad to I got employed at a rocket company? Yeah, I started in 2018 learning for my CCNA before I knew what a CCNA was. And then I got hired working on a rocket in 2021. So yeah, it's like three years. years. Yeah, that's amazing. What is what, a, what an amazing journey. I'm so lucky on terrestrial you know, networks. We don't have to deal with these challenges or we don't have to deal with them to such a degree, you know, that we do in space. So, for example, when a rocket is launching, it's exploding, right? It's yep. literally exploding in a controlled way, but still exploding. And it's enormous, right? So we're going to have a ton of vibration, more than you would see on Earth, even in like industrial spaces and things like that. Hey everyone, David Bumble coming to you from Cisco Live with a very special guest, Lexi, welcome. Hello, thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. I'm it's, a fan. Well, I appreciate it. Uh, it's something I've been wanting to set up for a long time. Yeah. You have a really interesting story, but we got to start with rockets because that's where you're at <laughs> in the moment, right? Yes, I'm at rockets at the moment. So tell us where, where, where do you work? I know, that, so just for everyone watching, there's some NDA stuff. So we'd, I'd love to extract more information from Lexi, but I, we can't. But where are you working? And like, are you kind of working on there's a type of ethernet that you mentioned? Well, I can't talk about specific protocols or technologies at all. But what I could say is I, I work at Blue Origin. Um, I'm an avionics integration engineer. So I'm on the networking nice team. Title. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it's a very impressive sounding title, right? Um, avionics is a portmanteau of like aviation and electronics. Okay. So it basically means I integrate the electronics for, you know, a flying vehicle. In this case, it's a rocket. So. Um, yeah, I'm specifically there to be like the expert on the network devices that are on the rocket and basically help integrate everything so that everybody on the rocket can talk to everybody else. That's amazing. So we were talking offline about there's a specific, the ethernet that you use on rockets generally is not the ethernet that we have on Earth, right? Well, it's not about ethernet or like a specific protocol like that, but really what the deal is for, you know, there's a lot of different space specific protocols that a lot of people have not heard about. There's layer one, layer two protocols out there just that people have developed for space. So when we're talking about the challenges of networking in outer space or a network that's designed to go into space, it's really about general challenges that we don't see much or at least as intensely as we like on Earth as we would in space. So for example, you know, when you're designing a network on a rocket, you need to make sure your devices can handle a lot of vibration. Yeah, the whole rocket going like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. A rocket going up into space, it literally is exploding, right? Yeah, exactly, to get up yeah. there in a controlled way, but yeah, it's exploding. So you have to have devices that are hardened and able to withstand a certain amount of vibration. And we do have industrial networks today and, and devices that are made to withstand a certain level of vibration, but it's still not quite the level that you would see on a rocket. So that's something we have to deal with. Also, the extremes of temperature, hot and cold. Yep. Again, industrial networking on Earth does touch on these things, but it's still way more extreme in outer space than it is on Earth. Um, we have to deal with ionizing radiation, which can cause okay. bit flips. Yeah, and that's something that we are definitely protected from on Earth because of the magnetic shield around the Earth that we have to deal with in space, we wouldn't be protected from. So your devices need to be able to recover from things like that. So if you have a lot of bit flips in your data or in yep. memory, basically to, to fix that, at least short term, we reboot the thing, right? We reboot okay. the device. So you need to have enough redundancy in your network that you can have something reboot to fix something like that and not have a problem, not lose packets, things like that. So we have a lot of challenges in space that are similar to what we have on Earth, but more intensely, I guess, a problem. So I mean, from a, like, let, let's start, let's go through the layers, right, if we can. I mean, just gen in general terms, like if I wanted to get into this, is it like Ethernet, like standard Ethernet cable, or is it like special types of Ethernet, and then like layer one, layer two? It kind depends, it depends. On different on different rockets, you can do different things, it's up to the company. So some, some places don't use Ethernet at all, some could. Um, again, I could talk about different, like the specific protocols I work on, but it's up to the company, right? You know, we, we have some kind of, there's a kind of Ethernet called time-triggered Ethernet. Yeah, that's what I was looking, wanting yeah, to learn yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. We were talking about that. So time-triggered Ethernet, again, not something that I necessarily work on, but it's it's out there as a, a, a very helpful protocol in industrial spaces yep. and in some cases on spacecraft because it's, it's a sort of layer two QoS type protocol almost. Okay. You're able to have something called a more, you know, a more deterministic network in that way 
um, you can run regular Ethernet with it, but also at the same time, if you have time critical applications, like again, in industrial settings, this is very important. You can actually make sure that specific types of data get to where they need to under a certain you know, latency SLA or something like that. So okay. it's, it's a really interesting protocol that not a lot of people know about. What, what's the name again? Time? Time Triggered Ethernet. Time so Triggered TTE. Ethernet. It's a special flavor of Ethernet. But you can read about that online, right? It's yeah, like a standard absolutely. or... Yeah, TTE is the company that developed it. I haven't been able to find any like certification surrounding it or anything, but I think it's gonna be more and more relevant as we get into outer space as you know, a species and humanity. And I'm, I'm really excited to see all the protocols that come out of casual space tourism and like try, you know, trying to do scientific stuff out in space. There's a lot that we still have to you know, develop in order to get us out there. So we have a lot of challenges when we're talking about designing a network for space or to go up into space for any amount of time that on terrestrial you know, networks, we don't have to deal with these challenges or we don't have to deal with them to such a degree you know, that we do in space. So for example, you know, when a rocket is launching, it's exploding, right? It's yep. literally exploding in a controlled way, but still exploding and it's enormous, right? So we're gonna have a ton of vibration, more than you would see on earth, even in like industrial spaces and things like that. So your connectors, your cabling, if you have it, like your, your chassis for your network devices have to be hardened enough that the links can actually physically stay connected while that thing is vibrating. Oh, ton. yeah. And so it has to be, you know, there, there's like an actual vibration rating, right, for all this stuff. You, you have to really pick your hardware purposely for that. Also, you know, radiation is another challenge that we don't really have to deal with on Earth. You know, you hear these jokes about like solar flares, yeah, you know, yeah. like in bit flips, but those are those are technically possible, but very, very rare on Earth. We're mostly, you know, shielded from any kind of crazy radiation that you'd see in space down here on Earth. But when you've got, you know, a network that's traveling up into space and gonna spend any amount of time there, you have what's called ionizing radiation. Okay. Ionizing radiation, now I'm not an astrophysicist, okay, but as I understand, Ionizing radiation is when you've got these atoms, these particles traveling through space so fast that they actually get ripped apart at an atomic level. So the nucleus of the atom and the electrons get pulled apart from each other and they speed you know, in various directions. And these, these particles are basically the ionizing radiation itself. And so when they interact with physical matter, they actually change it at an atomic level. So these particles are traveling, you know, from their point of origin so quickly that they're they're pulled apart and they can affect physical matter that they come into contact okay. with. So they'll actually change it at an atomic level. So we get things like um, bit flips as a result. So you have electronics in space and you know, these particles are traveling through, they can actually cause as data is traveling over wires or whatever, they can actually cause these bits to, to yep. actually change. And so your devices are gonna interpret that as increasing, increasing, you know, data being garbled until it's just reporting a ton of errors and it can't understand what data is being sent across. So yeah, you're not actually rebooting it from Earth yourself necessarily. These devices have to be fairly autonomous. Once that rocket launches, yeah. you know, you, you can't you can't just like quickly <laughs> drive to the data center. Yeah, because you don't you don't want anybody on Earth, whether it's you or someone else, right? Like to hackers be able to or whatever, exactly. Yeah. You don't want somebody to be able to get into your rocket and make it do things. So it's very autonomous once it's going up there so it ha your devices have to be able to sense when they are seeing too many errors past a certain threshold and then reboot themselves okay. right so you bake that into the hardware or whatever you're using the technologies um, so your network needs to be resilient enough you need to have redundancy or something baked in there so that when you reboot files when you reboot chassis like entire devices it can recover and you're not gonna lose any packets, ideally, right? Um, so similar to the issues that we have to plan for on Earth, but in, in a much like more extreme, intense uh, way. Yeah, 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 and you have to you have to deal with these radiation things. What about heat and cold? Because it, yeah. it's, it's very hot, isn't it, when it goes up and then it's yeah. very cold in space, yeah. right? Yeah, exploding on the ground once yeah. again. It's, so it's not just vibration, it's also a ton of heat from the fuel. And so that's an extreme of heat. And then you get up into space and it's very, very, very cold. Colder than you know temperatures that we would see on Earth. Um, so you have to have devices that, again, 
are physically hardened to be able to withstand that. Where did you learn this? I mean, you're learning this on the job and, and from people, but like, is there any resources online where you, people have got this kind of stuff? Yeah, so NASA releases a ton of stuff publicly about the technologies they use, the hardware they use, the protocols they use. They have a, a ton of stuff and I'm blanking on the, there, there's like the, the Deep Space Network, DSN. If you Google anything like Deep Space Network, NASA networking, they have a ton of stuff available publicly where you can just read about all of this. It's fascinating. You got to tell us a bit of your story. So you obviously got like 10 CCIEs. To <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you have to do that in order to be successful, right? That's the only way. Uh, no, I've only I've got a CCNA. Um, I got I got it with your help. Well, <laughs> honestly. Well, thanks. thanks. I mean, thank you. Um, but yeah, I have a CCNA. I, I had a whole other career prior to this. I won't go into all the details, but whole other career. I have a degree in English literature, right? Oh, so, wow. Yeah. So not super applicable to networking, but I just decided that I wanted to redo my career. I went back to school. I found Cisco Netacad. That just made me fall in love with networking. I didn't really know what I was looking at when I saw an IP address. But once that was explained to me in my like first or second Netacad class, it was like, psh, you know, it blew my mind. So I got my CCNA. I worked in a knock for a few years. And then, you know, I got, I got onto Twitter around that time and um, somebody at my current company found me that way on Twitter. Um, I used to sort of live stream myself learning things. Yeah, you were doing networking. like CCMP training on YouTube, yeah, right? I was, yeah, I was studying for the CCMP. Have not gotten it yet. Come on. <laughs> but I'll get it one day. Um, yeah, I was studying for the CCMP, live streaming myself, just going like, I don't understand this, but here's what I'm reading about it. You know, just talking through the learning process. This person found me and was like, hey, I think you know, we've got a role open at Blue and I, I think you'd be good at it, so. So when you applied, they have these, the job listing with like, you have to have all of these like things. It was, it was a very daunting um, job wreck, I'm not gonna lie. I, I saw it at first and I was like, I don't think I'm qualified for this. I don't think I could do this, but because this person encouraged me to apply anyway, I went through the first interview with them and it was great. It was a great experience. Everyone was very nice, but then I looked at that job wreck again and when they came to me and said, I want to do, we want to do a second interview with you. I was like, I sent them this long sort of emotional email. Like, you know, I don't think I'm qualified for this. Like everything on this job rec is like, you know, I'm not an expert in Python, you know, like I, I can't do all of this. And I, you deserve a candidate that can actually do all of this. And you're actually like trying to turn it down. Yeah, in a way. I, I, wow. I, I did. I hyped myself in, down. Imposter syndrome. <laughs> imposter syndrome. Yes, absolutely. Well, the job rec was so daunting. And so. You know, I said all of this and the, the manager and the architect both came back to me, wonderful people. And they, they both said, you know, in summary, like, you're a very humble person for saying this. Like, we still think you would be a great candidate. You had a great interview. We like you a lot. You'd fit in and we can tell that you will learn what you need to learn to be good at this job. And that's, and that's happened, matters. right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And now, now that person's my manager. And I work with the architects of the Rocket Network and it's it's my dream job. It's amazing. You got the job. You didn't know everything, but no. you were honest about that. And they knew they had to spend time training you. For me, when I look at trying to hire people, because I do that these days, <laughs> it's like um, it's, I'm, I'm not just techie anymore. It's the attitude. It's the motivation. That's more important many times than technical skills. I'm hearing that a lot more often now. And I really appreciate that because going into tech was really daunting for me coming from a very non-techie background. You know, I thought I had to be able to pass all these incredibly technical interviews and impress everybody and have a bunch of certs. But, you know, there's a time and a place. Certs are good. You know, it depends on what your situation is. But if you can show that you have a good attitude about learning, and that you're willing to, to learn what you need to to be good at the job and you're passionate about it, you're almost all the way there with just that, right? I've heard many people have said this, and I, I believe this, you can teach technical skills if someone has the aptitude to learn them, but you can't teach attitude, you can't teach motivation, you can't teach uh, character. Absolutely. And those, if, if someone has that, then that's the person you want in your team, right? And that's what they saw in you. I, I like to think so. That's basically what they told me. I, I am so grateful to be working at, you know, such a cool place and a place that really values those particular like traits in a person. And I, you know, I've, I'm not like an expert at anything still, but I've grown into the role. I absolutely love it. I learn something new every day. It's a weird, cool, very fun job. But I mean, I think the inspiration for everyone watching is qualification wise, according to like the metrics that a lot of people would use, it's you have CCNA, mm -hmm. but you're sending rockets into space. Yeah. Sorry, you wanted to say it's something? Just, no, 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 that's that's it. Like, and I don't wanna, I don't wanna, um, What's the word? Downplay I don't wanna, like the certs. I don't want to downplay the cert 
I am so, the CCNA opened so many doors for me. I'd recommend it to everyone all the time, anytime today, but you don't need to be the most qualified, the most sorted up person in the room, the person who can say the most buzzwords or talk about the most complicated things to be the right person for the job. How did your English literature stuff help you? Because, I mean, I, you didn't tell us too much about the background, but I'm pretty sure that helped you like write reports and like communicate. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people like to be down a little bit on the humanities degrees, but I don't no, no, believe no, no, in that. No. Yeah, it, it gave me a good foundation in communication skills, yep writing documentation and yeah. we all know is really really important in tech and it it helped me actually kind of am very passionate about documentation so i, I you know people value that because not a i was going to say you must like be like docs. everyone wants you on their team <laughs> yeah exactly so i it gave me a lot of these foundational skills critical thinking is yeah. so important you learn that with english literature and humanities degrees and it helped me learn a lot and and ultimately i'm glad i have that other background that's not tech because I think I feel more grateful and excited about tech and more passionate about it, having seen a whole different career that's not this, so. How long from I'm gonna start doing networking, like Netacad, to I got employed at a rocket company? I got very lucky, it was six months. What? Oh wait, sorry, at a rocket company, that's not correct. No, no, no that's fine. No, that, that, like. Six months from I'm gonna start learning networking to my first job, which was in a knock at, at a service provider. Yeah, I started in 2018 learning for my CCNA before I knew what a CCNA was. And then I got hired working on a rocket in 2021. So yeah, it's like three, three years. years. Yeah, That's amazing. What, years. Is, what, a, what an amazing journey. I'm so lucky. <laughs> yeah. Again, coming to luck, you put in the work you, and you put yourself out there, right? Because you were on Twitter. That's true. Now, I don't want to, there's an interesting conversation around, do you need to be on social media to get a good job and be yes. successful? No, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to, but if you're inclined to do it, you can leverage it to your to your advantage, right? I didn't, you know, I didn't get a lot of followers. I wasn't doing it for the followers, honestly. I started live streaming myself reading out of Cisco Press textbooks, <laughs> right? Hilarious. And making fun of like typos in them and stuff. But that's what got people's attention, right? I, I think that if you can show yourself learning and enjoying the learning, wanting to learn, having that passion, I think however you can showcase yourself doing that, that is a, a huge advantage for you in the job market. And I'll say this, I mean, I think technical people sometimes make the mistake of thinking they have to be just excellent at technical stuff, but you need to be good at marketing yourself. Yeah, that's true. And social media is a way to market yourself. Yeah, and I'll admit, I didn't know that's what I was doing when I started it. I just needed a way to study that kept me focused. It's so hard for me to just sit down and read out of a book unless I'm being held to like, okay, I'm on a live stream, so I really need to you know, keep yeah. going. Um, that was my unique way of doing it, and it turned out to resonate with a lot of people. Um, but yeah, if you can market yourself and you know find something unique that you can share with the world, it, it really makes you stand out to employers. I have a daughter. 12 years old, this is going to be very inspirational for her, but talk to girls that want to get into tech or ladies who are in tech. What's your advice? Oh man, that's such, that's such a question. <laughs> My answer changes every time somebody asks me this. Yep. I would say go for it. Yep. Just go for it. If you're, if you're even a little bit interested, just go for it. There's so much in tech I don't think people realize. So if you're not immediately interested in what's right in front of you, like building a PC, right? When I was little, it was like, I don't care about building PC, yeah. right? If you're not immediately interested in that, look into coding or look into security or, you know, there's so much under tech. I'd recommend talking to somebody that you know who is in some kind of tech position. Find out more about what you can learn about. Look at free YouTube videos. Explore it before you write it off, right? Um, I'd say if you're a woman who's already interested in getting into tech, but you don't know where to start, look at YouTube videos from creators who are already doing stuff like that. Look at, um, come to something like Cisco Live, right? Um, and ultimately, there's a lot of talk about women in tech having kind of a tough time, right? And I don't wanna gloss over that. It can vary company to company, but it can be still really wonderful. You can still find a very supportive space, especially today. I'd say if you're looking for your first job in tech, vet the company. Don't downplay your skills. Like you did. Yeah, <laughs> don't do what I did. I was lucky I had people that recognize that, but don't downplay your skills. Try to vet the companies that you're talking to as much as they're vetting you for the job. You, you can yeah. tell, you can yeah. get a sense for whether or not they're a safe place for you uh, in the interview. So 
talk and connect with other women who are in tech. That's also very important. And people can reach out to you on Twitter, right? Yes, yes, absolutely. I'm Track of Pacer on Twitter and every platform, actually. Track of Pacer, I'm on pretty much everything. So I would crawl over broken glass, not to be dramatic, to help another woman get into networking or tech in general. So please reach out to me. Um, there's also plenty of other women in tech who would love to help other women get into it. So we're here for you. <laughs> Really appreciate it. Thanks so much for sharing. Thank you. And for what an inspirational me. story, you know, three years from English literature, right? Yeah. To doing networking for stuff that goes into space. That is an amazing story. <laughs> Thank you so Lexi, much. Thanks. Thanks.